Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Ashken. Wow, this is loud. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm not part of the float community until now, until this last year, so I'm, I'm excited and I'm, I'm being very happy with how welcoming everything has been. Um, so here's what I would like to do today. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about you know, the science background behind what we're doing, and then show you what we're trying to accomplish with this um, EEG research protocols. Um, I'm a neurophysiologist. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. That's, that's my background. Um, I spent uh, several years at the National Institute of Health. I had a double affiliation there with the National Institute of Mental Health and the National Institute of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders. Um, and then after six years there, I spent another five years at the Salk Institute um, as a neurophysiology researcher. <clears throat> You've been hearing a lot about interception and monitoring the body interstate, and that's a lot of the work done at Lieber uh, by Justin Feinstein, Sahib, and a lot of our colleagues. My background is on conceptual representation and evolution of language, and uh, it's sort of a fancy way to say that I care about how do we make sense of the world, right? How we categorize different things, how we know that, you know, chairs and tables are pieces of furniture, or, you know, uh, sardines and pineapples or fruit, and how does the brain instantiate those things? How do we, you know, have that represented in the brain? So I spent several years um, with uh, Alex Martin, amongst other people, uh, looking at, you know, how does these processes occur? And what we know is, and like many other things, uh, and, and what was thought before, and that there's like a specific area that just, you know, has these nice packaged memories and representation of what we have, what we really find out is that what we call embodied cognition. There's a neural network that spreads the different features um, of what you're experiencing, and then it gets stored within that same network. So, for instance, you've been hearing about different um, insula, uh, middle frontal cortex, etc., different brain areas. Think about, in this case, in you know, different sensory areas, like visual cortex, auditory, somatosensory, and basically all these areas get active when you're experiencing something. So, for instance, when you see a dog, let's say, right, you're gonna have visual cortex being active about the visual features of the dog, the color, the shape, you know, four legs, how it looks like. You're gonna have somatosensory if you touch the dog and feel the fur, um, auditory if you hear the dog bark, etc. So there's, the idea is there's a neural network distributed and different brain areas working together, and the representation of the memory sort of emerges from this. Um, so we did a lot of work on this. Uh, we used techniques like the ones we've been seeing, fMRI and PET, so those big brain imaging where you have the nice brains with the blobs of colors and tells you where each thing is happening or which brain areas are involved. We did a lot of work on that, but for the purpose of this presentation, we're actually going to talk more about EEG, so electroencephalography. Um, after these years um, at the NIH and then at the Salk, and working, you know, just like Justin with fMRI and PET, one of the advantages of the EEG is that it gives you a better temporal resolution. So when you look at those, what we call T-maps, those brain activation maps that, you know, Sahib, Justin, Colleen has been showing you, you're basically looking where different things are happening in the brain. But then the key is the temporal resolution. How does each one of these areas actually, you know, plays a role in this thing? And EEG, or electroencephalography, can help you with the temporal resolution for that and give you the snapshot of most interesting events will occur below a second, 100, 300, 500, 600 milliseconds. So we really want to have a different technique for that. This is the traditional um, EEG gear setup. So let's see. There you go. So this is the usual cap. Each one of those things is, is an electrode, is a sensor. So these are passive sensors. Um, we usually gel them to get better conductance. Um, and then it's connected, you have a bunch of wires, it's connected to amplifiers, because this is a very, very, you know, microvolts level of signal. Uh, and we basically get all this gear up to measure electrical currents going through your scalp. What's happening is your neurons are fire, so your brain cells are firing, they create electrical charges. When different brain areas um, have electrodes firing together, you're going to have these waves of activity that just, you know, go through your scalp. And that's basically what we're measuring here and what people have been working on for many, many years. So what are the kind of things, the brain signals, that we can, uh, we can engage with it? There's definitely a, a vast variety of things, but the two main aspects is what we call event-related potentials. Um, and basically, 
This looks something like this. Um, this is two types of brain waves. And here the idea is you're going to stimulate the brain, let's say, with images or sounds. Um, and that's going to be sort of your time zero. And then you see how the brain responds to those images. So you could have, for instance, an attention task where you're going to ask people to you know, pay attention to a certain target image for a while. And then you're going to have other images that are distractors. This is an example of such a thing. Spikes that you see like this one or this one are different brain event-related potentials, which is basically your brain discriminating. In this case, between target images versus distractors images. And what this allows you to do is having a measure of you know, the neural response to attention. So for instance, if these um, differences are smaller, typically is associated with a worse performance on ascension. Okay? I'm not going to spend too much time with it, but I thought it was important that you guys get a bit of a background of the kind of, of things that we can see here. The other one is frequency analysis. And we're going to focus on this quite a bit. Um, while this one is associated in time lock to a specific event, and basically what we do is we replicate that event many times, average it, to then get this kind of wave, this is more about continuous monitoring. You can also associate it with different events, but the idea here is you're picking all these signals, so basically all the electricity that you have in one of these brain waves, and you're breaking it down by frequencies, okay? From lower frequencies, like here, to higher. So you have things like, and you know, on the floats, you keep hearing the theta state, right? So that comes from increased activity within this frequency band, which is theta. This is alpha, beta, and gamma. And basically what it means is when all these you know, different brain areas on the network are firing, what you're going to have is each aspect of that network is going to contribute at a different frequency. So you have a lot of work done on the past 50, 60 years, um, in some cases more, both on frequency analysis on ERPs, and really understanding how these neural measures correlate to behavior, to things like attention, memory, you know, all sorts of, of cognitive performance. So when you look at a graph like this, uh, and we're going to show you quite a bit of those, basically what you have is this is time, so it's going to start scrolling, and basically it's a passive of time. And here you get the different frequency bands with sort of um, lining it up for you, uh, and go from low frequency to high frequency. So this is usually sometimes between you know, 4 to 7 hertz, 7 to 14, uh, about 15 to 25, 30, and this is above 30. And of course, you know, it's hertz, right? So it means like how many times it cycles per second. Um, so you have lower frequency bands, low speed, and high frequency bands. I know this is not too exciting, but we will get exciting in a minute. Um, so, after you know, being doing research for several years at different institutes at National Institute of Health, one of the things that I started feeling that you know, was less satisfying, even though I'm, I'm still very interested in fundamental research, but was how much of those applications were coming true, right? So a lot of these brain signals, they've been known for, you know, depending on which one, 50, 30, 20 years. Uh, we know that one specific ERP, for instance, like mismatch negativity, it's you know, reduced in schizophrenia patients, in Alzheimer's patients, Parkinson's. Um, we know a lot of these things, but it's in a contained, restricted environment on a clinical setting. Because as you guys saw, there's this big EG machine connected to a bunch of amplifiers that's connected to computers. You need technical stuff um, to, um, and people to really you know, run and record. Then you need to do all of the analysis afterwards. So it's not something that could really scale. Um, and you know, quite frankly, we got to the point where we want to you know, more than see papers being written and put on drawers. We really want to see something you know, moving on and be translated into society. So that drove me and a few colleagues to um, found Neuroverse. And, and what we did is basically moving some of the things that we have discovered and, uh, and created at the Salk Institute and at the University of California, San Diego, um, and to try to really reach you know, somewhere beyond these bottlenecks on EEG and have something that will be you know, applicable for everyday life. So we sort of developed um, a couple of things. Uh, one of them was a different EEG device. You guys have seen little bits of it. So this is what we call the brain station. Um, in essence, it's a full EEG system with an amplifier. It works wirelessly and connects to a smartphone or an iPad app. Um, using low energy Bluetooth, uh, we have different types of sensors. Um, either your traditional rigid sensors like some of you guys probably seen before. We also use this technology called flexible electronics. Uh, that allows us to really print this pretty much hair-thin type of electrodes. We base them on a tegaderm adhesive, and that's what we're using in some of this float research. So again, I won't bother too much of the details, but this is important. The other part of it is we have a suite of applications, uh, one of them being Brain Vitals, like I said, runs on smartphones or iPads. And what it does is provides either stimulation or recording control over your device and whatever you want to do with it. 
So really for us, it's sort of the whole technology that, that we created is built on three things, okay? So the brain interface device, the brain station, the suite of mobile apps, and then very importantly, is this brain analytics database on the server. So a lot of our work is data analysis. So everything from, you know, if you're thinking about these event-related potentials, these ERPs, how you provide the stimulation is key. Uh, we need to have synchronies below 10 milliseconds from the time that your iPhone or your iPad is showing an image or a sound and how we put that timestamp on your EEG signal. Um, but also, the other aspect of it is how do you analyze the data? How do you, you know, tease apart muscle signals for all kind of other artifacts you might be picking up on? How do you really, you know, understand different cognitive aspects? So all of that comes from very different analysis procedures and algorithms that we try to, um, to understand and, and to perfect. Um, one of the great things for us on this, and we've been exploring different verticals, is really getting to know more on the scale of a population-based kind of approach, how do these things work? Ultimately, for us, the whole endeavor of Neuroverse is sort of creating this idea of a, a multipurpose platform when it can really create your brain interface for everyday life. So we have applications on health, of course, and, and, and this float is, is an extension of that. Um, projects going on with Parkinson's, uh, with schizophrenia, with migraine, um, different sort of applications with many different partnerships uh, on institutions and clinical centers. On the other side of things, we have this consumer electronics vertical, which sort of came afterwards, uh, where we're really looking into things like you know, gaming, entertainment, different aspects of it. And the thing that is really interesting for us is it really allows us to get into a much broader population in terms of data collection that then feeds back into the health, right? The health is gonna give you very specific clinical groups and patient groups that we know is gonna have some kind of modifications that we wanna understand better, but it's gonna be a smaller sample size. If you really want to be able to create brain signals and brain measures that can effectively translate into you know, many applications in society and hopefully really help us understand neuropsychiatric disorders and neurological disorders that are really ramping up in society, especially with increase of longevity, you really need to have a large scale population sample size. And it's not exactly like people are gonna do it just for the sake of doing it. You need to provide some value for them to do it. So that's the aspect that the entertainment side of things really helps us you know, reaching this broader level of consumer electronics, getting the data to help us understand better uh, what we're doing at it. So this is sort of my background pitch. Um, within these many things that we're doing, one that I think is more interesting and specifically relevant for this, um, is something we're doing with surfing. And this was actually done um, in collaboration with Justin as well. And again, if you want to have your brain interface for everyday life, uh, you need to be able to do something more than that, that someone sitting on a chair, right? Um, if you want to do it different activities and different things. Um, this is a project that we're particularly happy about, not just because you know, it's our system being tested and going over on you know, a hostile environment, so to speak, and something quite radical in many ways. Um, but you know, we were listening yesterday to um, different talks and different concerns of our veterans on PTSD. So Camp Pendleton actually has an entire program, and it's not the only one in the country. Australia is doing it as well, using surf as you know, a therapy for PTSD uh, patients. And part of the idea that you know, I thought this was very interesting, and, and Justin did as well and worked on this together, is how does that connect to this idea of the float? Because the one thing that is common between the two things is People relate about this as this idea of you know, getting in the zone, getting in the flow, being very focused about something, being able to sort of abstract and detach themselves from other stimulation uh, and, and remain in that sort of more calm, relaxed state. So that's at least the basis for this. Um, we engage in this program because there's some empirical evidence that definitely seems that you know, surf seems to help um, some of these patients, and we're trying to understand better um, why and how. And look, for us, this is not just you know, some um, intellectual luxury curiosity that we think, oh, it's great, let's find the mechanisms. It's whatever kind of things that we think that empirically are working, being surf, being floats, being whatever. If you understand them better, then chances are we're gonna be able to perfect the tools, we're gonna be able to perfect the use, and whatever help is giving right now, hopefully, we can increase that. Um, so let me show you quickly a video. So. This is uh, Denim. I was actually one of the reporters for a show that we're doing, surfing. So what you're going to see here is, you know, we have this GoPro linked to our system. 
This is the raw EEG signal on the top, and here you see the breakdown uh, on spectral analysis. So this is close to real time. You know, basically the frame you're seeing on the videos that you see there uh, is about the two seconds um, delay. And you'll see, you know, all of this. You'll see like this. Basically, every time that you see red means that you have high power on that. When you see blue is a reduction of power on that frequency band. You see how power is all throughout everything here. Uh, we're missing muscle and all of the other things together with EG brain signals. But an interesting thing, you see how it starts, when it relaxes, it starts changing, and you really go down. So high frequencies like uh, gamma and especially beta really get reduced, and you have this sort of theta and part of alpha effects. So this is something that was really interesting to us. But of course, the one thing we want to understand really and try to test is, are these really reflecting your mental states? Or is it just about you know, one specific activity that you might be doing? And does this have to do with muscles, for instance, which we know that we're going to be picking up on? So we test a different thing. So if you look at the left side, um, this is Denim when he started surfing. So early in the session, uh, he had just got into the water uh, maybe a couple of minutes ago. He's trying to look for the good waves. You have him just sitting on a board here, so basically remaining pretty much static. And in this case, you have him paddling down here. What is interesting is you see it's two different activities. In one case, you know, he's physically moving, so there's a lot of muscle contribution. In the other one, he's just sitting there. But if you look at the neural representation, you see how common it is that you have all this activity within the beta frequency band and expand it into gamma. And at this point, you know, his stress is you know, focusing on the wave, but he's not relaxed. He just started, he's trying to unplug, but he's still pretty much connected to everything that is going on. Now, let's take a look about you know, later in that surf session, 35, 45 minutes into it, and you get the same exact activities, right? So he's either sitting on a board or he's paddling. But now you can see like he's relaxed, he's laughing, he doesn't have this sort of stressed out face, and you see this you know, clear reduction on high level frequencies uh, and a maintenance on or the relative power on alpha and, and on beta being on, sorry, on theta being much higher. And the other thing I guess I should say to keep in mind is every time you see these blobs of the red and the blue, right, it's all relative power. What we mean is if you take whatever amount of activity in volts that is happening at that moment in time, we're looking and saying how much percentually each one of these frequencies is contributing to that, right? And that means that different neural networks are at play. So this is something we're very excited about seeing. Uh, many aspects to it. One, he starts giving us some insights about how activities like, you know, surfing in this case, but of course, the logical uh, follow-up is meditation, and all these other activities can have a neural signature that can help us understand that. And the other thing is that this system actually works well, even in more sort of radical situations in the real world, being able to tease apart uh, artifacts and still really pick on different mental states. But then, you know, how do we get from there to floating, right? And uh, for me, this is sort of a happenstance, and I think you know, Justin mentioned that um, yesterday. Uh, but basically, uh, we have a very good common friend, Kyle Simmons, which I think gave a talk here last year. Uh, me and Kyle go way back, 2004. Uh, we're colleagues at the NIH before Kyle moved to the Liber Institute years ago. And we've been developing the system, and last year, um, I feel like I know Justin for my whole life, but it's really has been less than a year. Um, so last year, Kyle came to Neuroverse, and uh, we're talking, he was giving a talk in San Diego, and we were discussing some of the things, and he saw our system and said, you know, I need to introduce you to this guy. He's really looking for an EG system, he's been doing it for years, you know, he wants to do, you know, he's a great guy, he came out of Caltech, he has all this cool research that in interception, I said, okay. It's like, and he does this thing, you know, these float things, and I was like, oh, now you're losing me right there, right? Look, guys, I'm not... I'm not the stereotypical kind of guy that is going to get really primed you know, for floating on meditation. No judgment, nothing wrong with that, obviously. It's just not you know, my normal personality. It's not the kind of, I'm always on edge. I'm always stressful. You know, I, I can't do meditation. I, don't, I feel like I don't have the patience for it. So uh, I'm very skeptical about all these kind of things. Obviously, my background you know, is on a different aspect of mental processing. But you know, talking to Justin on a phone, I was really impressed with how careful he was building his program, how structured his research was. Um, and after a few phone calls, he really you know, convinced me to come to Libor and you know, check out the flow tanks and see what you can do. And of course, that's problem number two. We get there and we think, oh yeah, we have this system that we can use in real life. You know, it's very versatile, we can do all these things. But then I get there and he's showing me the tanks and we're talking about it and I said, oh great, okay, now we have high humidity, 
right? We have basically a very heavy saline solution, which really means ions on steroids, which really means that we're going to have these incredible electrical charges within that environment, which really means that that's a problem that Justin has been having for three years, right? Is how do we get that to not connect to the sensors, not cap or amplifier, so basically create all these artifacts due to the environment that does not allow you to read what is really going on in the brain. And then, of course, you still have to worry about water getting into your system, or even worse, salt getting into your system. So we tried to find out what we could do with it. And um, you know, when I got there, I'm, I'm thinking about it, and Justin tells me, you know, you just need to try it. And I think that you know, when you try it, you're really going to get what we're trying to do here. I think it's going to be great. And honestly, I'm just like thinking, that's no point. <laughs> uh, so I'm like, no, nah, that, that's OK, Justin. You know, I just flew in at 5. It's now 8. It, it, it's all right. It's like, no, no, you've got to try this thing. And after you know, some convincing, he told me, OK, we're going to do this. And I said, fine, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And he goes like, no, 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 no. You need to do like a 90-minute session. I said, you're out of your mind if you think that I'm going <laughs> to lay there for 90 minutes. It's not going to happen, buddy. I'm going to be annoyed. I'm going to be bored. I, I'm just going to get out of there. And you know, more convincing. And we ended up you know, compromising and saying, I tell you, OK, I'll do my best to last for 45 minutes. They may or may not happen. I might walk out in 10. But I'll do my best, OK? I'll try. And then you cue me with the lights and the music after 45 minutes. So I went in. And it was an amazing experience. I'm not going to go self-indulging here and what it was or it wasn't. But you know, needless to say that, that I was convinced. I was hooked with something very, very different than anything that I experienced. And in my mind, really opening a lot of different possibilities. The other kind of thing that was striking to me immediately when I got out was two things. One was just this sort of almost like clean palette for once you get out of the float, I went into the shower, and just, you know, just the acuity on auditory perception, on visual perception, was a really strong subjective experiment immediately post-float. The other thing was this complete notion of, of losing the notion of time. So I come out and I tell Justin, you know what? You got me. I'm impressed. This is actually good. And yeah, I was able to last the 45 minutes. You know, you were right. This was great. And I start feeling the smirk on his face. And he goes, like, you were there for over 90 minutes. <laughs> um, so that's Justin for you. Never trust him. Uh, so look, I'm obviously preaching to the choir here in terms of why we like floating, what is it about the floats. Um, but really, you know, for us was then you know, embarking this mission to see, OK, how can we do this? How can we put the brain station on floating? How can we really you know, help out on this research program of measuring brain activity pre, post, and during floating? The pre, post are no-brainers, OK? And we're doing things like the event-related potentials that I show you guys. So we're having different tests for memory, for attention. And we're trying to look for benefits on pre and post. Um, I'll tell a little bit more about it later. Um, similar to what you've seen uh, Justin, Sahib, Colleen presenting, and Pan presenting with fMRI results, right? But the key for us here is, can we see the during? Can we actually have some kind of documentation about what's going on on this experience? What are the neural modulations? What are the signatures? What are the correlates? How you go through these states, you know? Can we build in, you know, in pioneering work done by people like Tom Fine that I'm guessing it's somewhere in there um, that I had the pleasure of meeting and, and did great work with it before. Can we use today's technology and build on that and really try to create a window to what is, what are the neural correlates of this subjective uh, cognitive experience? Um, and for that, we're using um, frequency modulation. So basically, we're able to get the system going. Um, this is actually Denim is the same guy that you saw surfing, because we really want to compare you know, his experience surfing with his experience floating. And what I'm going to show you guys here is, again, a spectrogram. Um, but in this case, what's going to happen is, instead of being real time that you saw before on the surfing kind of thing, uh, what we're going to do is sort of a time lapse video, OK? So I don't think you can really see the numbers here. Those are actually the real time in minutes. Um, and what we're doing is a time lapse video of, in this case, Damon's experience throughout the float. So we're condensing, you know, about, in this case, about 60 minutes into something like 10 seconds. Because one thing you know, to keep in mind is, in some cases, these are slow moving patterns, if you really want to see those patterns. right? So we need to record continuously, get it to a decent chunk of time. But then you want to time lapse, and you want to judge it in a way that it can really become apparent to you. And you know, we're very, very excited uh, for the first time to say, hey, this is actually working. We can actually see 
how your brain is modulating things while they're in the float. And uh, thank you. We're really excited about it. Really excited. So that's our first thing. We're saying, oh, this is great. We got it to work. And then we go, oh, what does it mean? Uh, so look, this, all of this that I'm showing you guys is the first time we're showing it anywhere. Uh, my first visit to Libor was actually in November of last year. Um, and we just finished analyzing this data. And this is all very, very preliminary, OK? Um, so take it with a big grain of salt um, while setting up to do this research program. But there's a few things that I can share with you guys that we're very excited about. Um, one is, OK, can we you know, start looking at different people? So what you have here is four different floaters at four different sessions. So let's take a look at floater number one. So typically, you start with you know, a more high activity. And then what we're seeing is you go through a stage at about 30 minutes when you have more and more of a reduction uh, overall in power. Uh, and that's kind of like around this stage. And then you start having these bursts of gamma and theta. Okay? We see this in one of the floaters. And this is, by the way, somewhat naive floaters. What I mean by this is when we're talking about experienced floaters, is someone with over 100 floats. This is people with either their first float or maybe within the first three. Okay? This is one person. Let's look at another one. So the same kind of pattern. You have a high activity on the beginning, some beta as well. And then within time, as in this case he starts to relaxing, um, you start to see this decrease of overall power. That's one of the stages. And then you get your burst of theta, and you get your burst um, of gamma up there. Um, so we saw this repeatedly in over you know, 12 people. And one thing that you know, we're pretty excited about is when you think about this in terms of the literature, um, theta, you know, the famous theta state. Um, OK, so number one, one thing that I'll point out is we believe, or at least what we're seeing at this point, is, is this is not a binary thing, right? Where you're going to go from this awake state into another state, and that's it. It's a process, like anything that goes on the brain, right? It's a temporal dynamic process that keeps changing. Uh, we are trying to identify different stages of that process. Um, what we're seeing so far, and again, very preliminary, is that it does seem to have these stages where you have overall activity, then you go to this depression of activity, a big fall down, and then you get into some stage where you have these gamma and theta bursts. Um, theta has been associated with um, with relaxation, with meditation, with this sort of you know, calm, relaxed state. Um, gamma, well, there's different theories. One of the prevalent theory that is pretty interested in has to do with visual binding or you know, visual conscious awareness. And the idea here is, you know, as I told you before, this is a very slow signal. This is a very fast signal. And gamma, people believe, or some of them, um, that is originated by the thalamus and is this very quick front to back signal. And, the idea here, the hypothesis, is that it's binding in that moment in time because it's so fast. So we're talking about you know, 40, 45 times per second. What it's doing is binding all of the different brain areas for an experience, right? I was telling you that, and that's what I did originally, that the brain has this distributed center of, you know, you're looking at you know, high order visual things. This is the shape, this is the color, you know, this is the feeling, and you go through all of that. All right, I need to speed up because I just got the red coming in. Um, so the idea here is that you, know, you have to have all this temporal binding and synchrony and is a maximizing sensitive state. And it's common between you know, most of the people that we're seeing. Here's another example, and I just use this one to say there's also variability, right? So when you see things like you know, beta coming in, uh, which you'll see on this person, because they focus on something during the float, you're going to have this common part, but you're also going to have variability. Moreover, if you have an expert person, in this case, this is actually Justin's, um, spectrogram, you see that he's much faster, actually has this big gamma and theta in beta originally, then he goes more rapidly into the crease, and he gets into what we're now calling this alpha you know, moment. Um, so different frequency bands correspond to different neural networks. Again, some individual variation on different things. This is to give you another example of now same floater, um, two different days. This was earlier, and you get the same gamma and um, theta bursts, as you expect after the decrease. Um, and then this is the same guy, uh, but after a few floats, when he's getting better. One of the things, and again, that is very preliminary, but we're excited about this, it doesn't seem to be a static thing. Experience matters and changes um, as you 
go through multiple floats, which is intuitive for what a lot of you guys you know, report, but we seem to have it. So we see some little bursts of alpha that we see on the expert ones. We start getting that when people want to go through multiple floats. When you look at more of a group analysis, what we're really seeing in most cases is within you know, anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes on IE floaters, you really have this decrease of energy, and especially within the high frequency bands, leaving your theta and your um, beta things. Another thing to keep in mind is events matter. What you're doing in the float is going to change things. So here's three examples. This is a case when instead of just leaving the person free floating, we're actually doing meditation instructions at specific points in time for breathing, right? So what do you get? Look at this, a big beta kind of coming up and gamma that time. Why? Because now this person is focusing in your instructions. So the brain is now essentially doing something else. It's not being absent for everything and just turning inwards. Now it's actually trying to pay attention to what we have. Um, here's another case when we're doing you know, blood pressure cuff measurements. That's an artifact caused by it. So we need to be aware of those things when you're using this kind of systems. This is another example where we have like really decrease of low activity, even though there's still some um, auditory stimulation, in this case, ocean waves. So I'm out of time. So here's what we're doing and what we intend to do in sort of two big points. One, of course, as I said, looking at pre and post neural modulations and see how that corresponds to the mental states. Uh, we're really interested in this whole idea of temporal dynamics during floating. So if that's one thing I'd like you guys to walk out of your ear is, don't think about it as a two-state thing. Don't think about it as, oh, we go from whatever wake to theta. Think about it as a process that has a lot of different things. Um, the other thing we're very interested in are their transference effects, right? So does some of this relaxation meditation, these states that you have there, do they then transfer to real life in the rest of your activities? You know, we know, again, empirically that people are more relaxed, um, that they seem to be happier, the whole glamour after effect, but is that really a long-lasting kind of benefit? And it would be great for us to know, because then we can also play out um, different neural feedback tools that you can use. And then this is the things to keep in mind, individual variability. It's going to be there between sessions, between individuals. You need to account for that. What are the really group and population effects? Are there specialization and plasticity? So um, I'm happy to say that both at Lieber and uh, with Jim at uh, Just Float, we're putting together a full IRB research protocol about to submit it now. It took us about six months to put it together. We're looking at expert floaters over 100 hours in float versus naive floaters. And looking at effects of long-term plasticity and specialization. And then, of course, ultimately, the comparison between healthy and clinical populations. Um, you know, we've been hearing about, you know, anorexia nervosa, PTSD, general anxiety disorders. Um, you know, the team at Libra and ourselves believe that this can be really helpful, the fact of floating, to a lot of these things, but we need to understand the mechanisms to make it better and create more effective tools. So, without further ado, thank you, all of you, for your attention, and I'm very happy to be this community. Thank you, my buddy, Thank you, guys.